All right. Okay, well, I want to welcome everyone to today's service. Did there be the word ordinary? <laughs> yes, I believe there is. And once again, I want to ask everyone if you can hold your questions until after the service. The word ordinary? Yes. So we can um, go fluidly through the material, through God's Word. Amen. You know me, I, I tend to be very thorough in, in my approach. And so it takes me long enough just to get through one or two verses, uh, let alone answering your fine, uh, very intellectual questions. I do appreciate them, but just hang on to them until after the service, okay? So, I want to welcome everyone once again to Christ Reformed Church. I'm Pastor Ferguson, and it's a blessing to be gathered together in the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. If you love the Lord, then you say amen. Amen. Leroy, are you with us? Huh? You with us? Oh, yeah. Say amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> I got to keep check on my little sheep here. Okay. Make sure they ain't falling asleep on me. Yeah. Well, as always, uh, we have another day whereby we can go into God's Word. We can find out the secrets of God's Word. He doesn't reveal these secrets to the world. But he reveals them to his children, doesn't he? Yes, and we are his children. We are the sheep of his pasture. He is our pastor. So that makes us his little flock. And we are children of the Lord by virtue of the Lord, by his saving work on the cross. He saved us from the penalty of our sins, which was eternal wrath, which would have been poured out against you and me if it hadn't been for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It would still be poured out against you and I. It would be waiting for you and I if it hadn't been for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what sets Christianity apart from Islam and Buddhism and Catholicism and Seventh-day Adventism and all the other isms out there. Because we have a Savior. See, there's no Savior in Islam, is there? No. There's no Savior in Buddhism, is there? There's no Savior in Islam. There's no Savior in Seventh-day Adventism. Only Christianity has a Savior. Amen? All the other religions will leave you to yourself. That's not a good place to be, is it? No. Especially when the Bible says, All have fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And that if you break one of the least commandments of God, you're guilty of all. And where does that send you? Not purgatory. Not into celestial heaven because you blew yourself up in the name of Allah. No. It sends a man to hell, doesn't it? To hell fire. To hell fire. See? Without... Jesus Christ living in your heart, you have no Savior. You will not be saved in the day of judgment. You will not be spared. You will face the eternal wrath of God. It's eternal, isn't it? It's not like you just have to go down there and burn for a day or two. No. It is forever and ever and ever. It never stops. See? But Jesus has provided the atonement. And that's what we're going to talk about today in our 
continued study of Galatians chapter 3. But before we go there, we go to God in a word of prayer. Amen. Don't you love praying? Don't you love to pray? Pray. One man said, much prayer, much power. No prayer, no power. Little prayer, little power. <laughs> well, Jesus said we ought always to pray and not faint. We ought always to watch and pray. What do we watch for? We watch for the tempter. We, we watch our, the footsteps of our path. We, we watch where we're going. We watch what we're doing. We should not be watching television, should we? Because we can't learn anything about God and His Word, 99% of the stuff on TV. <laughs> there may be 1%, uh, maybe one decent preacher might come on, and I'm not talking about Joel Osteen or T.D. Jakes or Free Flow Dollar or Benny Hinn or all the rest of those jokers because they're after one thing, money. They want your money, don't they? And that's why they preach about money. They preach about how to live the prosperous life. Jesus didn't preach about that, did he? Jesus preached about the Beatitudes. Jesus preached about suffering for the sake of the kingdom of God. He, he preached about repentance of your sins, didn't he? In fact, that was the first word that came out of his mouth in his public ministry, wasn't it? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the same thing John the Baptist said. They both preached the same message, repentance. Without repentance, your faith is dead says James. He says if you don't have repentance, if you're not turning away from the lust of your flesh, the lust of your eyes, the pride of life, you're not repenting, are you? Repentance means you've got to make a decision. You're, you're going to turn away from those things. You're going you're gonna, to, instead of spending countless amount of hours watching television, that's what I call it, <laughs> You pick up the Word of God and you say, I need to begin reading this. If I'm going to spend eternity with the one who wrote this book, I better get busy starting to read about him and see what he says. Because I'm going to look pretty stupid if I get into heaven and I don't even know what the man, what, 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 what the Lord said in his book. Anyway, I'll hold your question until after the sermon. So, let us go to God in the work in the Lord of Prayer, and we'll get started. Let us pray, Heavenly Father. We thank you once again for your Word. It's a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. And God Almighty, we pray and ask that you will continue to bless our reading, understanding, application, and memorization of this thy holy and righteous word. God, we pray and ask you will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all iniquity, creating us clean hearts and renew right minds within us. We thank you, dear Lord, for laying your life down on our behalf, on behalf of all who believe and repent of their sins. And indeed, both are gifts from you. We thank you and praise you for your perfect love for us, for your perfect life of obedience that we can pattern our own lives after. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for living in us and sanctifying us, setting us apart for Jesus Christ, to be made like him into his image. We praise you and love your Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Help us in our weak physical bodies. We pray you will bless each one of us and those who belong to you throughout the world. You will continue to draw us closer unto thyself. We ask these things 
in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're going to resume where we left off in the book of Galatians and chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. I trust you all are enjoying this little letter that Paul wrote to the Galatians as much as I am. Now we left off last time in verse 22. We had just read 19 through 22. 22 ends by saying, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Amen? Pretty self-evident and self-explanatory. I don't need to elaborate any further upon that, other than the fact that all are under sin. So if you come across somebody who says, I'm not a sinner, or sin is not real, as the Unitarians say. They don't even believe that sin exists. Uh, you might take them to the Word of God, and this verse 22 of chapter 3 in Galatians, where it says, God and the Scripture have concluded all under sin. So if they say, there is no such thing as sin, or I am not a sinner, then, in essence, what they're saying, they're calling God a liar, aren't they? Because Jesus Christ, we know He is God, and He put His hand of approval on the Word of God, didn't He? He used the Word of God to rebuke the devil, didn't He? Yes. So if Jesus hadn't approved the Old Testament, then why did he spend so much time in the synagogues? Why did he spend so much time quoting the Old Testament, talking about David and Elijah and Abraham and all these men? No. He loved the Word of God. Why? Because he is the Word of God. That would be like him denying himself. <laughs> if he were to say, I don't believe in Genesis uh, or the book of Psalms or that, those works, uh, he would basically be saying, I don't believe in myself, wouldn't he? He'd basically be denying what he himself had written, had said. Because John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were created by Him. Right? That's Christ. He is the Word of God. Let's go to verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should be afterwards be revealed. So let me elucidate on this verse. Before faith came, we were kept under the law. So the faith, obviously, is in reference to Christ, isn't it? What Paul is talking about here is before we entered in to faith in Christ, we were kept under the law. We were condemned by the law, weren't we? The law was hanging over our necks like a uh, blade that they used back in the Renaissance time. I can't think of the exact thing. Huh? Guillotine. Thank you. Yes, a guillotine. The law was like a guillotine waiting to behead us, wasn't it? But God in His sovereignty, He had already had a plan, didn't he? He had already chose us, the Bible says, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, 
before the foundations of the world, He chose us in Christ. So God was not going to let that guillotine of the law fall and behead us, was He? No, God had a plan for us. It says, before faith came, we, Paul is using the personal plural pronoun, we were kept under the law. He's saying, before I entered into faith in Christ, I was under the law. You don't want to be under the law, my friends, because the law will crush you. You don't stand a chance against God's perfect law, do you? You say, I've kept the law like the rich young ruler. Remember, he came to Jesus. He said, what must I do to eternal life, to, to have eternal life? What must I do? And Jesus says, well, keep the law. Yeah, love your father, mother, and don't covet. And the young man said, all of these have I kept from my youth. He was so blind, he, he, he couldn't even see an inch in front of himself, could he? Now, I've kept the law. Jesus says, really? Well, why don't you keep this? Go and sell all that you have and come and follow me. And the man said, I can't keep that law. <laughs> uh, I've got a little too much cash in my bank account, Lord. You, you, you mean I have to sell it all? If, yes, if you, want to, if you want everlasting life and eternal life with me, and you need to let go of your God. Can you fit her by? Okay. Right oh, no, she can go. It was probably better not block the... Here, let me move this. Come on back here. Oh, I'm not ashamed. We're making way. How you doing? All right, good, good. Thank you. Okay. So, the law. You don't want to be under the law. If you're under the law, then the law is going to damn you in hell, isn't it? Because the law says, you have to keep me perfectly in order to get into heaven. Perfect. You can never covet anything. You can never tell a lie. You can never lust after another man or woman. You can have no other gods before me. And let's just go back to the law, shall we? I know y'all want to hear the Ten Commandments. And the law is actually more than Ten Commandments. It's the entire Word of God. <laughs> There's more than 600 commands just in the Old Testament, and there is more than 1,000 in the New. But I just want to take you back to 10. Back found in Exodus chapter 20. And let me read uh, just a few here. It says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. See? Egypt was a picture of the law. You know that? Hagar. Remember Hagar? Abraham's second wife. She, she was a picture of bondage because she was not of the promise, was she? She did not give birth to the promised seed of Isaac, did she? No. She was a picture of bondage, of slavery to the law, of slavery to Egypt. And God has to deliver you from Egypt before you get into the promised land, that's not. Let's see what the first commandment is. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You say, I, I have never had any other gods besides Jehovah. Really? Is that why you love to sit and watch and, and stare at that black box for nine, ten hours a day? That seems like a god to me. Right? 
Whatever you give attention to, is that why you like to go polish your car and, uh, every Sunday and get it all glistening so all the other church members can say, wow, such a beautiful car. Is that why you, 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 you pay all these people to manicure your lawn and keep your house looking perfect because your house is your God? Yeah. See, your God doesn't have to be a, a, a golden calf. Uh, it can be money. It can be a job. It can be your, your husband or wife or your children uh, or your pets. It, it can be your house. It can be your car. It can be television. It can be the radio if it's ungodly yeah. music you're listening to. It can be anything. So we broken. That command, everybody. I don't even have to read the other nine. We can't even get past the first one, can we, Brother Tom? No, because we've all had other gods besides the true God in our life at one point or another, haven't we? Yes. If any man says he has no other God, has always said, well, that person's self-deceived. First of all, you come into the world as a sinner. You're not, you don't come into the world born again. That's, that's ridiculous. Say, so he, hey, I was born again, again, and again. How many times were you? I was born into the world again. Wait a second. Did you live here before you were born? <laughs> Is that what you're saying? I asked some people, how long have you been a Christian? They said, all my life. I said, all your life? How? You were born again when you were born? How did that happen? You were born again when you were conceived in the womb? Wow. Maybe you know something I don't know. Well, the Bible says you're born in sin. You're not born again when you're born. You're born in sin into this world. Amen. We all come into the world dead upon our own. Dead to God. Dead. Why? Because we're born in sin. Okay. Let me just read one more of these Ten Commandments. Uh, maybe two more. Thou shalt, not make, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them nor serve them. Uh-oh. we got a problem, don't we? Because there's something... 99% of every American's house that people like to sit down in front of and bow down in front of and essentially worship every day and every night, don't they? And it's called television. Right? It, it, they come on first thing, where's that remote? The game's on. I, I gotta check out the game. I, I gotta I gotta watch this show of mine. I I I I, I it's a, see, it's a part of their life, isn't it? And until the Lord opened your eyes and you realize, I don't need to be giving that thing my attention, then you're not going to be set free, are you? You're going to be in bondage. It's going to be your God, that, that car. You're always worried about it getting scratched or something happening to it. That's your God. See? Or the house, always worried about how it looks and, and having company, entertaining people. Well, that's, that's not the right mindset, see? As God promises to give us clothing and shelter and food, He promises those things to us, but we're not to get caught up in the things that He gives to us, but just to use them. Okay. Use them as gifts from God. And sure, we should be good stewards of them, but we're not to, to love them, is what I'm trying to say. Okay? That's the word. Love. You hear people, I love that, that uh, shirt. You love it. Well, the Bible says in 1 John, in chapter 2.15, If any man love the world or the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, was not of the Father is of the world, the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen? Amen. Thou shalt not love the things of the world. I hear a lot of Christians say, Oh, I love that. I love this. I love that house. I love that food. The Bible says, if you love the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. You love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You love your neighbor as yourself. And you love whatever animals or pets God gives to you because they have souls they're created. You take care of them. But you don't love the non-living things such as uh, food and clothes and houses and cars and television and stuff like this and the phone and the internet. Don't love those things. Okay? Don't love, especially don't not love money. The love of money is the root of all evil, isn't it? The Bible says if you love money like these prosperity preachers, they love money, don't they? Always talking about money. Send us your money. Send us your money. We'll send you a blessing. Well, why do I have to send you my money? Won't you send me your money? Huh? Right. I want a blessing. You say you're going to send me a blessing. Send me your paycheck. Right? Why do I have to send you my money? Why don't you send me your money since you live in a $10 million house uh, as Joe Osteen does and Jake's and all the rest of them. Multi-millionaires. And they're saying, give us more. These are these are people, these are preachers that are preaching to itching ears, so to speak. And people, cer certain things that they know people want to hear that's what they're preaching about. They're, they're feel-good preachers, in other words. They make you kind of feel good, you know, on the inside. But that feeling shortly goes away, doesn't it? As soon as the service is out, hey, 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 I don't feel so good now. <laughs> Boy, can you keep preaching a little bit more about health, wealth, and prosperity? Make me feel good. <laughs> No, because life is not always about feeling good, is it? Sometimes you feel bad. Sometimes you're sick. Sometimes you're hurt. Sometimes you ain't got a job. Sometimes you're broke. Sometimes you're sad. Sometimes you're angry. The main thing is being obedient to the Word of God, isn't it? It, it is surrendering your will over to Christ's will. Now, let me turn back to Galatians since we've already, all of us can safely say we've broken the first two commands without question. I don't even need to go into thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not cover, covet thy neighbor's house, or thy neighbor's wife, or his manservant, anything he has, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus says, if you even look at a person and lust after him, you've committed adultery in your heart. And there's not a single soul on the face of this earth who has never lusted after another person. I can guarantee you that. Because I know the heart is corrupt. And the heart, all it wants to do, the old heart, is lust. It wants things. See? And it's never satisfied until it gets those things. Well, let's go back to Galatians. But before faith came, verse 23, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. You hear that? See, now I understand what Pastor Ferdinand 
that Rachel got, but it's last four weeks. The, the schoolmaster. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. To, to literally drive you to Christ. The schoolmaster, remember the principal? He had a board hanging up on his wall and had holes in it. You ever see that? He went into his office and uh, he said, what's that? He said, well, that's for bad boys. <laughs> yeah, that, that's for people who break my rules. <laughs> see? Uh, we can think of the principal as the law. He, he's laying down the law. He says, if you break the law, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break your, your rear end. <laughs> right? <laughs> With that paddle. Well, that's what the law, the law says, I can't save you, but I sure can condemn you, and I can chasten you, right, for breaking me. I can get my paddle board out, is that to call it, paddle board? Yeah. And it wasn't for paddling a little ball either, and not that kind of paddle board, it was for paddling your tail in. Yeah, it's for your good. So the law was for our good. It was to show us that we need a Savior. Understand? That's why God gave the law. He, he didn't have to give us the law. He could have just sent us to hell for, breaking, for being sinners. For breaking His one command that He gave to Adam. Namely, don't eat of the fruit. When Adam ate of the fruit, he died, didn't he? Spiritually. And since then, every man comes into the world dead. Because Adam is our, our head, our representative. We died in Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, we died in him. In Adam we died. Okay? But God didn't even have to give us the law. He gave us the law to show us our need for Christ. To bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So you can't be justified by faith faith in the law, but the law didn't go to the cross, did it? <laughs> Do you know anybody who, whose name was the law? If they lived 2,000 years ago or whatever? 3,000, 4,000? No. Matter of fact, I've never met anybody whose name was law. <laughs> first name law. I met some people last name law, but not first name law. Anyways, the law did not die for your sins. The, the law was given by God to show you that you need a Savior. Right? It was, to, it was like a mirror. It makes you see yourself. The law, when you look at the law, you say, man, I'm really ugly. <laughs> the law says you can't be this good. Yeah. The law says... This is what you are. This is me. The law says, now look at me. I, I, am, I am nice. I'm handsome. I'm perfect. Now let's look at you. <laughs> I'm a worm compared to the law. I, I'm worse than the dirt of the ground that God cursed. What did he say? Cursed be the ground because of your sin in Genesis. Well, verse 25, but after that faith is come, in other words, once you've been born again, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We get a different schoolmaster, don't we? Once you've been born again, you come out from under the law. The law cannot condemn you anymore. It's as if you leave the courtroom altogether. The judge says, not guilty. And that's Christ. It's, the father says, not guilty. Say, the law is standing over here, the prosecuting attorney, that's the law. The law says, now he's broken this, judge. He's broken that, he's broken that, he's broken this, he's broken. He's broken every commandment in your body. <laughs> and the judge says, uh, 
And do you have a defense? <laughs> yes, I, I do have a defense attorney. Name's Jesus Christ. And in fact, you know who Jesus Christ is? He's not only the defense attorney, he's the judge! <laughs> Did you have a you have a, a defense attorney? And you look at him and you say, Yes, you. Judge, you. He says, That's right. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Yes. And I declare you not guilty by because you believe in me. Because you have faith. In, me. in fact, the faith that you have, I gave it to you. <laughs> it's a gift, according to Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9. By faith through grace you have been saved, and that, the faith, is not of your own, it's a gift of God. Amen? The judge says, yes, you've been saved by grace through faith, I gave both of them to you. Not guilty. You're free to go. You're free to leave this courtroom and the law is standing over there and saying, wow, <laughs> another one goes free, <laughs> right? But let's put another man in the courtroom, okay? Let's put another man, the law, God says, now what do you bring in accusation against this man? And the law says he's broken every command in the book. The judge said, looks at the man and says, is this true? The man said, yes, it's true. And do you have an attorney, a defense attorney? And the man says, unfortunately, I don't. He said, what's your defense? Uh, well, I thought I was a good person. I didn't do as much bad as Johnny or uh, uh, Joey. That's not a defense. You are guilty, and you have no payment. You, 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 you cannot pay for this sin, the sin, the, the crimes you've committed. And the man said, no, I can't pay. And that's a debt way too beyond me. It, you mean that's a payment that can never be paid. You're asking me to pay something, I just don't have it. I said, well, if there's no payment, behalf of these crimes, I'm going to have to sentence you. And your sentence is going to be eternity in hell. You say, wait a second, that, that seems a little unfair. Well, that's a little long, don't you think? Eternity? Um. Yes, because that's the penalty for unpaid for sin. Eternity. You had an opportunity, but you didn't receive it. And so the man is sentenced to eternity in hell. Well, let's see what verse 26 says. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? You are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's what makes you a child of God. You believe in Jesus Christ. Amen? That is what makes you a child of God. Now only make sure that your faith has repentance and good works attached to it. You don't just say, yes, I believe, and then you continue on your merry, sinful way. That faith is not going to save you, is it? That'd be like me saying, now, uh, I believe that I can swim across that river I believe I can do it. And people say, well, let's see you do it. Uh, <laughs> but 
Maybe later. I can't. I ain't got time to be showing you today. Well, how do we know? Do you really believe? If your belief is real, that's you show us. See, I'm from Missouri. That's the show me stand. So, everybody up there, they, they say, show me. Say, I got this thing here. It works pretty good. Everybody say, show me. Everywhere you go, show me. And if you couldn't show them, and they say, get out of here. <laughs> get back in the woods. Right? Well, I think you get my point. If you cannot demonstrate your faith in Christ by repentance and good works, your faith is dead. As James says, faith without works is dead. It's not real. Is it? The demons believe in God, don't they? Satan believes in God. That's an idiot. He knows God's real. He's not denying God. He believes in God. He believes in Jesus Christ. But is his faith in Christ saving? No. Because he does, he's not willing to repent. He cannot repent. Can he? Not as an angel, he can. But to as many as received him, the Bible says, to these became the children of God. In verse 27, St. Paul is furthering his case. For as many of you as have been baptized into water have put on Christ. Is that what it says? No. It doesn't say that. It says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. See, that water can't save you. Can it? The water baptism can't save you. A lot of people believe that. Yeah, I've been, I've been baptized. I was raised in a Baptist uh, Duncan Church, Duncan, Duncan Centers, Duncan Donuts. Huh? That's what a lot of people act like, donuts, don't they? <laughs> Duncan Donuts. Today we're going to dunk another donut. Donut. A donut. Maybe that's where they got that. Dunkin' Donuts. Maybe they, they borrowed that from the Baptist Church. Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know. I'm just being facetious. I think you know what I mean. A lot of people want to be baptized because they think that's going to save them. They've never been saved. You don't get baptized until you've first been saved, my friend. You get saved first, and then you go into the water. And then you get the water on your head, however you want to do it. You want to go underwater, fine. If you want them to sprinkle water on your head, that's fine too. It doesn't matter how it's done. The matter of fact is, has your heart, have you been baptized into Christ? Amen. Because if you haven't been baptized into the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, you ain't got no business going into that baptismal duty. Because the baptism is merely an outward sign of what has already transpired inward. You are making a profession to the world saying, I've been born again and I'm going to go ahead and prove it. I'm going to go ahead and validate my claim by being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everybody, you don't take the Lord's Supper unless you've been born again. It would be like going to somebody's dinner party and you haven't been invited. You say, who's this man? Where did he come from? I didn't, he wasn't on the invitation list. He just came in off the street. Are we gonna are they gonna serve him? Probably not. Yeah. They're gonna say, uh, sir, have you been given an invitation? And say, no. I just smell the food in here. <laughs> They're going to say, well, you see that exit sign over there? That's where you need to go. 
Without being born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven, John 3, 3. Let alone get in and die. See? Oh, how many people have taken of the Lord's Supper and they have no right to even be sitting at His table? See, Judas, although he sat at the table at the Last Supper, he left before the cup was given. He took the bread, but he didn't get the cup. You know, see? Because the cup, that's where the blood is. And Judas, he wasn't even interested. He left before the cup was even handed out. He was so worried about betraying Jesus, he didn't even care about the Passover meal. Tell us where his heart was. Yeah. His heart was with money, wasn't it? He loved money. Money was his God. Well, for as many of you as have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. See, you put Christ on Christ. When you get born again, you're not the same. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, isn't it? He, he gets a new nature, a new suit, right? a new outfit. We, the book of Revelation said we, we were given white robes, robes of righteousness, no stains, just glistening white. And every child of God gets a white robe. And that's the righteousness of Christ. So when God looks at you, He sees a beautiful white robe. He says, boy, that looks good. Thank you. Oh, my child. It's the righteousness of Christ. It's His robe. It's Christ's robe. Remember to cast lots for Christ's robe at His crucifixion, didn't they? Yeah. They gambled. Then they're gambling at the foot of the cross. Didn't last long because when 12 o'clock hit, God turned the lights off. Did they? It was darkness over the entire land from 12 to 3. Three hours of complete darkness. He put he turned the sun off. He said, Son, we're gonna turn you off for a little bit. Three hours, complete darkness. Couldn't see what was going on. They probably tried to make a little fire or something, but then a big storm, you know, the 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 earth was shaking, an earthquake. And then the veil in the temple was ripped in two. All kinds of stuff was happening. And the soldier says, Surely, man, what's going on here? Surely this was the Son of God. Didn't it? For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. My question to you is, have you been baptized into Christ and have you put on Christ? Is Christ on you? Is He covering your sins? David says in the book of Psalm, verse, uh, chapter 32, Blessed is the man whose sin is covered, whose transgression is forgiven. Your sins have to be covered in order to be washed away. As Isaiah said, Come, let us reason together, though your sins be red as scarlet, crimson, as wine, I'll make them white as snow. How does he do that? By covering them with Christ. With, with the righteousness of Christ. With the finished work of Christ on the cross. Right. That's how it comes. When Christ gives you a robe, I can guarantee you, you're going to want to wear it. <laughs> you, you 
you, you will wear it. Because he puts it on you himself. You don't put it on yourself. Yeah. He puts it on you. Like a, like a mother or a father put clothes to baby. Baby doesn't walk. Baby doesn't walk to the dresser and say, hey, uh, let's see, I'm going to get out of this crib. I know I'm only six weeks old, but I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to go find me some clothes and I'm going to dress myself. Uh -uh. Doesn't happen that way, does it? No. Baby says, Wah. Right? And mommy says, Oh, Joey's crying. Must have soiled himself. Time to change his diapers. They put it warm. Sweater on it with some warm little sweatpants. The mom and dad does that, don't they? They clothe the baby. When you get born again, God clothes you. You follow me? God puts his clothes on you. That's the kind of clothes you want to have on it. It's clothes made by God. It ain't made, made by Polo. That Polo ain't gonna save you. <laughs> made by Ralph the Red La La Who? Made by Izod. Izod didn't die for your sin. Gucci didn't die for your sin. <laughs> Nike, Adidas, whoever you like to wear, they did not for your sin. But if that robe says made by Christ, you are going to want to be there. Thank you. <laughs> See, that's the clothes I want to do. Unfortunately, you cannot buy that robe with money, can you? No? These preachers say, well, I would like to have that young ruler came to Christ. I would like to purchase that robe of, of salvation off of you, Jesus. Jesus says it ain't for sale. <laughs> oh, so, so, uh, hey, surely a uh, hundred thousand will buy it, won't it? Nope. A million. I'd give you a million dollars for that robe of righteousness that would get me into heaven. And Jesus says it ain't for sale. You follow me? But what must I do to get the robe of righteousness? Believe on me. You don't buy salvation like Simon the magician, remember him? He says, he comes along and says, hey, how much for the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Peter says, how much? Your money perish with you in hell. Get away from me. <laughs> Essentially, that's what Peter said. <laughs> Get lost. Boy, I can make some good money off that Holy Spirit doing miracles and stuff. <laughs> Peter says, silver and gold we don't have. But in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, get up. Right? He didn't say, now, in order for you to get healed, like the Catholic Church said, now, in order for you to uh, stay out of hell, you need to give us some money. You need to you need to put your offering and uh, that's not gonna say is it? Boy they got people believing it, don't they? Because they think I can get the best of both worlds. I I can have all my goodies here and now, my money, my mansion, my fine clothing and my cars and and delicacies and all this. And as long as I give so much to the church, I'm guaranteed a spot in heaven too. Woo! I got it made. You fool. That's what God says. You don't strike a financial deal with God. God owns all that filthy money in your pocket. You think you're going to give him something that he already owns? <laughs> you, you're going to pay a debt with something he owns? With his money? Nothing. The debt cannot be paid. Nothing. You have to enter into Christ. 
You have to be baptized into Christ. The only way you can be baptized into Christ is if you have died with Christ. You must be crucified with Christ. In order to be crucified with Christ, you must believe that He died for your sins. Simple as that. Mohammed can't save you. Mohammed didn't die for anybody's sins. In fact, Mohammed's still laying in the grave. He didn't get up. I don't know why people have so much faith in him. He's dead. Jesus ain't in the tomb, is he? Jesus got up. Well, Jesus got he got himself up. He says, I have power, John chapter 10, lay my life down and take it up again. Uh, he says, uh, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will build it again. I will lift it up. I will write it up. He said, I, he's the one. In three, they said, hey, it took 46 years to build this temple. How are you going to build this in three days? And a blind. Yeah, blind leading the blind, not a good case scenario, right? If the blind lead the blind, both are going to fall in the pit. It's pretty simple, ain't it? Yeah. Like a deaf, a deaf person trying to uh, listen to something they can't hear. You ask them, now what was that sermon about? What sermon? <laughs> Don't you know I'm deaf? can't hear nothing. I thought you just heard my question. No. You get my point. <laughs> Jesus says you have eyes that don't see, ears that don't hear. Huh? So do your gods. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. You see where Paul is going now? There's no Baptist, there's no Presbyterian, there's no Methodist, there's no this and that, there's no German, there's no African, there's no, I'm this kind, I'm a Jewish Christian. Well, I'm a German Christian. Well, I'm a, I'm an African Christian. You ain't nothing if that's how you think, Paul says. It says we're all one in Christ. Right? God don't care. God is colorblind when it comes to the color of your skin or where you descend from. And God don't care about that. But what people do, don't they? Man, my heritage. Ooh, I got some fine lineage. <laughs> oh, really? Because let's go back a little bit further than where you're going. And I could take you all the way back to the garden. I can tell you that you and I have the same mom and dad. We do. Call Mr. Adam and Mrs. Eve. We all have the same first parents. You understand that? Everybody say amen. That makes us all related, doesn't it? That makes us all children of the same parents. Yeah, that's, that's biblical. That's sound. Why are we fighting over race and all this crazy stuff? When we're all the same family. I don't know. The man sure does like to distinguish himself, doesn't he? They say, I'm better, I'm more athletic, or I'm more intellectual, or I'm more spiritual, or I'm this and that. Paul says, you ain't nothing. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free. Doesn't matter if you're a slave or a free man. Doesn't matter if you're a male or a female. Doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, where you came from, who you belong to, what your last name is. It don't matter. We're all one in Christ, is what he says. Yeah. We're all one in Christ. That's 
that's why Jesus, when he laid his, remember he laid his hands on the little children? And the disciple says, Lord, what, what's he doing? What are, you, what are you messing with those little kids, those dirty little children, playing in the dirt? Remember? He said, why is he? And Jesus said, you stay back. Now, the children of heaven, he laid his hands on them. He said, the children of heaven, the kingdom belong to the children of heaven. He laid his hands on them and blessed them. So that tells me when a child dies in infancy or in childhood, and I don't know the exact age or whatever. I'm sure it's different for every child. But those children go to heaven when they die. Why? Because Jesus said the kingdom of heaven belongs to children. David said, uh, I can't go to, or he can't come to me when his child died, his one year old child. Did he have a Bathsheba? God killed the baby because it was out of order, so to speak. And David says, I can't, and he can't come back to me, but I can go on going to him. He's referring to the child in heaven. So I have a firm conviction that every aborted child goes to heaven. And that's good to know. Because in America, there are over one million babies killed every year. Just in America. Now you add up to China, they're probably ten times that number, at least. Imagine that. What are we doing? Look how evil man is. Now, how can you just... How can you just murder a, a baby? It ain't even been born. Don't start. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Yep. That's gross. It, it's it, 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 it's just inhumane. You know, we get people that get all all excited, all the upset about the humane society, and how they have to euthanize dogs and cats and stuff, and. Granted, you know, nobody likes to see that, but we're talking about human beings here. We're not talking about animals. We eat animals. <laughs> we eat cows. We eat chickens. We eat, right? And then God prescribed that. God never said it's wrong to kill an animal. But He did say it's wrong to kill a baby. He, he said it's murder. God calls it murder. We call it abortion. God calls it murder. Amen? Amer America is guilty of murdering babies. But we need to pray for our president because he is pro-life. He's doing, he's doing everything in his power to eliminate abortion. But I thank God we got President that we have in the office. Yeah. Uh, who did it? Trying to tell what was it? Our president. Oh, okay. He's pro life. Yeah. And he's working on eliminating and making it illegal to perform abortions. Oh, okay. That's why the liberals don't like him. That's one reason why. Because they want the, their rights to kill. Yeah. Isn't that terrible? Women, there's no such thing as a woman's right to kill her baby. You don't have the right. That'd be like me saying, okay, I have the right to murder my family because they're, they live in my house. No. That's stupid. That's, that, that's, that is evil. She does not have the right to kill another human being. That baby belongs to God. Not her. She's in her womb, but that doesn't make her that doesn't make it her property. That's a, that's a separate person in there. Yeah. She's carrying the baby. That baby belonged to God. Well, that's another sermon. But let me finish with one last verse here. Verse 29. Galatians chapter 3, the final verse of the chapter. 
And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay? All goes back to the promise that God gave to Abraham. In thy seed shall all the nations of the world be blessed. Amen. The seed is Christ. We are in Christ, and so therefore, we are part of Abraham's seed, singular. Because the seed of Abraham is Christ, right? Paul's just being a little redundant here. He's saying, if you be Christ, in other words, he could say, if you be uh, the seed of Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, because the seed of Abraham is Christ too. He's saying the same thing. He's just repeating himself, isn't he? Yeah. Paul likes to do that, doesn't he? Yeah. And get his point across. He likes to kind of go over it again and again and again. And he says it in this book. He'll say it in another book. He's, he's always reiterating in order that we get it. Well, I think we can stop right there. Until next time, we'll pick it up in chapter 4. Amen. Y'all enjoying the book of Galatians? A beautiful book, isn't it? Yeah, yeah you, you're getting a real good hold on, on, on grace and the law and what the law did to drive you to Christ. To, you see how you're part of the seed of Christ. Say, Pastor, why did you explain this in the, the first year you were preaching to us? <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I had to prep you. <laughs> I had to get you ready for us to meet. Right? The best. God said the best for us. Amen. We haven't even got to the other books of the New Testament. Hey, we got a lot of good stuff. Well, in the Bible there are. We know me. Oh, in the Galatians there's uh, six chapters. Yeah, so we're on going. We're going to be on number four uh, next week, and then we'll have four and five and six, and then we'll probably roll over into Ephesians after that. So, ah, this is where you grow. Amen. In doctrine, in, 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 the, in the truth. I mean, that's what sets a man free, isn't it? John 8 32. The truth shall set you free. I didn't write it, God did. <laughs> I'm just telling you what God wrote. And that makes things right, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I'm not up here telling you you're going to get rich or you know, having a big healing service or anything like that. Um, God can heal you when and wherever He wants to heal you. He's not exempt. And you know, God is holding the world in space. <laughs> I mean, He's holding everything together. I just want to say a quick note and then we'll pray and we'll be better. Do you know how many Earths, planet Earths, can fit into the sun? Huh? Anybody? A hundred million. One, you can take one hundred million planet Earths and fit them into the sun. That's how big the sun is. No, I'm saying you think how big this sun is. Oh, yeah. Oh. Of your thumb? And then this is how big it is compared to the sun. Right. Amen. Good, good analogy. 100 million Earths. Come on, guys. If it in the sun. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for being so great and awesome and marvelous. We thank you for sharing your truth with us. Oh Lord, we praise you. We thank you for the finished work you did on our behalf. We thank 
you for giving us the robe of righteousness. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would grant us the grace to live righteous lives, to live sin, uh, uh, sin abandoning lives. Father, we will turn our backs on sin and we will cleave unto you and run to you. We know you hold all things together the power of your word. We pray and ask that you will make us more like Christ this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. You know, you know what verse is. You know how many 